I'd like you now to imagine that we now live in the days that these psalms were written, the, the days that they were sung, or were in the days of David and Asaph. When we get these psalms, that uh, we understand how it works. We don't need these indents and colors. Uh, it's just we've been brought up with it. Our mums taught us from a, a child how to understand these matching patterns. How happy is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered, whom Yahweh does not impute iniquity. We can see it saying the same thing. And down here we see right away that it repeats again, and in the middle there's this time when he's silent. And it all makes sense to us. Or if we lived in the first century Ecclesia, and each of us have a psalm. Uh, this is quoted in Romans chapter 4 by Paul, and he had this psalm. This was part of him. So the first question we have is, who is it that his transgression was forgiven? He sinned, there was iniquity, and he kept silent for a time. And in the title, we have David. Uh, so most of us know, or the margin of our Bibles have, this is David and Bathsheba. And it's Second Samuel 11 and 12. We've looked at the poetry at this level. So this, this is, we're going to look at the time frame when this was written. And then we're going to look at how there's a pattern in scripture as a whole of, of this, um, these thoughts. In Second Samuel chapter 11, uh, David is on the roof of his house at night and he sees a beautiful woman Bathsheba and he invites her up to his palace. Bathsheba was married to Uriah and Uriah was away. Uriah is off with Joab fighting a battle. So Bathsheba comes up to the house, David lays with her and she goes back home. Then she reports back to David that I am with child. Now this would have had David worried. So David didn't know what to do. He felt he was in trouble. So what he does is he invites Uriah to come back from the battle and come to his place, his palace. Uriah does not go to see his wife. And David wants Uriah to go down, be with your wife, hoping that the child will appear that it came from Uriah. But Uriah does not go out. He lays at the door of David's palace. In 2 Samuel 11 verse 9 it says, But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of the Lord and did not go down to his house. We'll see here that there's this day and night sequence, because David is keeping silent. He's not letting Uriah know what's up. He's not letting the kingdom know what's up. And he has these groanings that go all day long. And day and night, your hand is heavy on me. We'll look at this day and night sequence. So in verse 12, it says, so Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. In verse 13 it reads, And that evening he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. So you can see this day and night, David's worried, what's going to happen? So David, with all his groanings and his planning, he decides that he's going to send Uriah back to Joab, back to the battle. In the morning, it happened that David wrote this letter to Joab and sent it by Uriah's hand. And he wrote in this letter saying, set Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retreat from him that he may be struck down and die. So you see 
Uriah brought his own death letter to the commander, and he was killed. So now when we read this psalm here, When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. Selah. We could see the, the feelings that David had as he was trying to deal with his sin. But the thing that David had done displeased Yahweh. So then Nathan comes to David and he tells him a parable. He said there was a rich man with exceeding many flocks and herds and a poor man that had nothing except one ewe lamb and he cherished that ewe lamb. One day a traveler came to the rich man and the rich man refused to take from his own flock. Instead, he took the one ewe lamb from the poor man and prepared it who had come for him. So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man and he said to Nathan, As Yahweh lives, the man who has done this shall die and he shall restore fourfold because he did this thing and he had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. So now David's own judgment, he would feel the words that he just said that he shall surely die and he shall restore fourfold. How was David going to restore fourfold on what he has done? And he says, I have sinned against Yahweh. So Nathan says, Yahweh has put away your sin, you shall not die. We can see here now when David is talking about his iniquity, transgression, and sin. Here we see the emotions David went through when he acknowledged his sin. And my iniquity I have not covered. I will confess my transgressions to Yahweh and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Selah. So can we just imagine for a moment how this felt with David? He loved the Ten Commandments, which were stored in the Ark of the Covenant, this golden chest, stored in what was called the Tabernacle of David. And he had moved all this up to the city of David, into Jerusalem. Uh, so this whole ordeal would have been absolutely devastating that he broke the commandments. So King David had sinned. He had broken the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. He had committed adultery or immorality. And um, it says, you shall not kill. And he had Uriah killed. So David was forgiven. And he was told, you shall not die. In Second Samuel 12, verse 13. So we see up at the top of the song, 
whose transgression is forgiven, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. The judgment that came from David's own mouth, that that man shall restore fourfold, uh, David saw unfolded in his own family as he had four sons die. First, the baby from Bathsheba. Second, uh, the, his child Amnon. Then Absalom. And finally, Adonijah. These sons seem to pick up David's bad behaviors and imitate them in their lives. Um, Amnon uh, took his sister Tamar, which made Absalom mad, so Absalom goes and, and kills Amnon. And in that chapter, uh, it even prophesies in chapter 12, verse 10 to 12, uh, the behaviors that Absalom uh, would do. Uh, he, he too committed adultery, adultery and killed. Now, when we look at the psalm uh, and see the words of the psalm, he says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. Um, and I'm going to guide you with my eyes. And then there's this warning, don't be like the horse or like the mule, which have no understanding. That's rejecting the teaching and instruction. Now, if you have a King James Version, it says thee and thee. And anyone that studied um, and used the King James for a while, you get used to that thee means it's singular, meaning one person. And uh, if you look in the Hebrew, it's actually a male, masculine. So he's instructing one of his children in a way that they should go. And he's warning them, don't be like a horse or a mule which have no understanding. What David's doing is he's warning them, don't be like me when I kept silent, when I sinned and, and transgressed. He's trying to encourage his sons uh, to have the attitude in which uh, they can be forgiven. Um, Absalom probably had some time in which he could have been forgiven for the murder of his brother. Now this may seem sad and um, kind of depressing, and scripture is that way. It's a mix of both uplifting things, things that build you up, like at the top, the, the sins forgiven and being uh, transgression covered, but it also has the stories of those that don't do that, that don't ask for forgiveness and that, that are not repentant. Now, one thing that I found very positive in this story is this part of David's judgment, restore. He got that from Exodus 22, verse 1. Restore is shalam, and we probably recognize the sounds. It's, it's the action word of to make peace. Shalom. So if you're going to restore something, to make something good, um, to get to this state of peace, um, you, you restore the lambs that we, you, which you took. You, you try and make something better. Uh, I'll just try and put up uh, a website called Java Scripture, and you'll see how this idea of restoring uh, relates to peace. So if you see Exodus 22 verse 1 here, if a man shall steal an ox or a sheep and kill it, he shall sell it, and he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. This is what David is quoting. But you can see uh, verse 34, the last chapter, the owner of the pit shall make it good. It's the same word, a shalam. Um, and uh, down here in verse 3, the sun be risen upon him, that the blood be shed on him, for he shall make full restitution. Shalam. It's actually uh, doubled up there uh, in the Hebrew. Uh, it goes on all through the chapter. So if we really want to understand 
what it means to provide or give peace to someone. You're restoring something. So even though, even in the prophecy that Absalom, there would be a son that would behave like Absalom in chapter 12, there was this glimmer of hope taken from the other part, is this idea of restoring. And we see that he had another son in that same chapter 12, and he named him Solomon or Shalomo. Now Yahweh loved him. So we all know Isaiah 9, verse 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Prince of Shalom, of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it, establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. So David had sinned. Now, in this sin, breaking the commandments, committing adultery and murder, uh, he would have his own Bible to look at. He would have had to look back in his scriptures uh, to see, well, how can I be forgiven? Is there a sacrifice or something that can be done? Uh, so David does look back. David looked back to Aaron, who was the high priest. We have a king looking back at a priest. And this priest, too, had sinned. Aaron, too, had broken the Ten Commandments. He had broken the first one in making a golden calf an idol. Uh, Moses had prayed for him, and uh, Aaron, too, had been forgiven. Aaron, too, David would relate to him because he had sons die as well, Nadab and Abihu. Certain family members... Uh, they loved Yahweh, but other family members, they um, despised Yahweh, and they would do it even if there was uh, instruction and teaching not to. When David's looking back to Aaron, we had a transgression that was forgiven, a sin that was covered, uh, iniquity that was not imputed, and we see this forgiven down here, and when there's something that surrounds him, it's this mercy. So there's a passage that talks about all these words. So the mercy in this psalm here, forgiveness in this psalm up here, are all talked about in Exodus 34. So we have here in Exodus 34, this pentacle. This is when Moses had smashed the first set of commandments because of Aaron's calf. Moses had pleaded with God, gone back up the mountain with a second set of tablets. And those tablets were probably the ones that David uh, now was preciously storing in Jerusalem this second set of tablets. Now, when that second set of tablets was given, it says, Yahweh, Yahweh, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in mercy 
and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And then it goes on, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children. So we see here, he even emphasizes, when you get used to looking for those inverse patterns, he puts the word abounding in mercy. And he repeats it again right below. Keeping mercy for thousands. He's just emphasizing that mercy. That's the chesed up here. And he forgives. The time that the, the law was broken is the time when this part of God's character uh, comes out. Unless there is an iniquity, a golden calf, a transgression and a sin, these two characteristics can't come out. And we can't develop that character unless uh, we too have been on both sides of that experience. Either we have sinned or others have sinned against us. And then this other part of Yahweh's character comes forth. So in the psalm, he repeats twice the iniquity transgression of sin and visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children. David knew from the prophecy in that chapter that there would be one of his sons. He might not have known it would be Absalom. He's trying to instruct that son to uh, learn about God's mercy, learn about forgiveness, confess those sins and those transgressions. What else is wonderful on this? is that in the middle of the Ten Commandments, or near the top, uh, there's some special words that, that align with this as well. This uh, part of the Ten Commandments in the, in the top of it, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children of those who hate me. So some, some children hate Yahweh, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. So there's that chesed, that mercy again. Um, the mercy up here. Mercy shall surround him. So even within God's commandments, God can tell people's hearts whether they, they hate him or they love him. And those that love him, God shows mercy to. Even though uh, we continually have iniquities, transgressions, and sin. So I hope we get a sense of how these Ten Commandments stored in a golden box were so precious to some. If, if you didn't murder, if you didn't commit adultery, if you didn't steal, all these things uh, were well deserving of being treasured uh, above anything. And a nation might come in and look in this box and see a set of stones and th th what is that? But the idea of behaviors that keep uh, families and neighbors and everyone uh, well, uh, and the idea that if we do make a mistake and we still love Yahweh, that there is mercy for those who love him. So we start to see that uh, these little patterns that echo within the verse of a psalm, then within the whole psalm, uh, they also echo back and forth through all of Scripture. David's looking back, and uh, you can find other places in Scripture where there is uh, sin and forgiveness of the sin. When the spies rejected the promised land, uh, God's character is brought out. Also in the days of Hezekiah, and elsewhere in scriptures. And when you meditate on these things, they just all start to connect together uh, like no other song. So in the next video, I want to look at uh, one other part of these songs. That word here, Selah. What does Selah mean? <laughs>